How many of us have hit a point in our lives where we were looking for a fresh start, a reboot, another chance? Lauren, or as her friends called her, L. Cho, hit that spot in her life, and she made some changes to really give herself a new shot. Unfortunately, only a number of months after that, she would go missing, and in a pretty tough climate. We're now coming up on almost two months of her being missing, and we need help. This case is a blip on YouTube, doesn't have a NamUs profile yet. We've got work to do, and I need your help. We've got to turn on the searchlight for Lauren Cho. Welcome to Brain Scratch Searchlight. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with me here today. Let's go ahead and get into this case and see what we can learn about it. And we're starting with an interesting article at medium.com about disappearances in this area. The title of this, of this article is Missing in Joshua Tree, and it's written by Calypso Skits. The self-proclaimed oasis of the desert, 29 Palms, California, and the eight 100,000 plus acres of nearby Joshua Tree National Park. The future of the park is uncertain. An estimated 1.3 million Joshua trees were burned in the Mojave National Preserve last August. As a result of climate change, the constant wildfires and consistent heat waves, they're likely to destroy Joshua Tree National Park by the end of the century. But the trees aren't the only thing disappearing in the Mojave Desert. The land and lore of the area spark pilgrimages from all over the world. Over 2 million people visit the park annually. They come out to pay their respects to the dissipating flora. But many who visit will end up missing as well. Flyers splayed across bus stops and gas pumps offer a chilling welcome to anyone driving into the neighboring towns of Joshua Tree and 29 Palms. It was the first thing I noticed as we pulled into the desert, a white billboard with red lettering. Did you see or help this woman on June 16th? Her name and photo had bleached beneath the endless sun. I didn't think much of it until we noticed similar signs and posters, all with different faces, different races, and different genders. I observed missing posters of three different women who had all disappeared between the beginning of June and mid-July. The most prominent per missing persons case is of 30-year-old Lauren Cho. In addition to the rise in missing persons, at least three bodies have been uncovered within a six-month time frame. That's one of the things I'm kind of concerned about um, with this case. And I think not because I think any of the bodies, the recovery of bodies that I've found are related. I don't believe any of them are related to Lauren's disappearance. But just within a matter of days of her disappearance, three bodies are found relatively close. We're talking within maybe like a, a 20 mile, 25 mile radius of, of where she went missing. And once again, I don't think it's related to the case. I'm just saying, I just want to speak to the harsh elements. I know in one of those cases in particular, um, they, they didn't have the ME's report yet, but they were fairly confident that it was the elements that took a man's life. Depending on who you ask, an additional three to five questionable deaths have occurred within 14 months. Let's go ahead and learn a little bit more about the area. Now, this article is kind of focused specifically on 29 Palms, Joshua Tree. Uh, we're looking at the Morongo Valley area. And in particular, where she goes missing is just kind of on the western, northwestern cusp of Joshua Tree and just a little bit from 29 Palms. Morongo Valley is a census designated place on State Route 62 in San Bernardino County, California, United States. The population was 3,552 at the 2010 census. It's located about 10 miles west of Yucca Valley. Morongo Valley lies along the western edge of the Mojave Desert and near the northern edge of the Coachella Valley and as such is generally dry. And if, you've, if you're familiar with California at all, you've probably heard references to how hot it can be in the Mojave and honestly in Coachella Valley as well. Monsoonal moisture leads to thunderstorms at times during the summer, but in the winter, Pacific storms bring most of the rain. According to the United States Census Bureau, the CDP has a total area of over just over 25 square miles, all of it 
is land. Um, so let's go ahead and get into the basics on this case. Now, unfortunately, I came name to NamUs looking for a profile for Lauren Cho. There isn't one yet. Uh, I've already reached out to them to check and see if one is in development. And if it is, we'll go ahead and let them do their job. If it's not, I'm going to go ahead and kick in the work and we will get her profile started and hopefully get that posted with NamUs very soon. Because of that, we're going to have to rely on her poster for kind of the vital statistics. Missing. L, like I mentioned before, her friends referred to her as L. Lauren Cho, age 30, standing at five foot four inches tall, weighing around 110 pounds. Last seen Monday, June 28th, around 3 p.m. in Yucca Valley, Morongo Valley area. She was wearing a yellow t-shirt and jean shorts. I understand she was also wearing Doc Martens based on some comments that I'm hearing um, from people that are looking for her. I don't know if they're the same ones that we can see in this photo here, but that's going to be an interesting fact as we get into some of the details in this case. Uh, they have contact information and a case number here. I've got that in the description box down below and on the screen right now. You can contact Detective Abels directly using that number 760-366-4175. Uh, please do refer to the case number. Like I mentioned, I have that in the detail box down below if you need that after this video. They also have a method to call in anonymous tips. I've got that down there as well. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I don't know if we're looking at a foul play scenario here. Um, with some of the details, I'm concerned that that might be a possibility. Um, law enforcement doesn't seem to be investigating it in that manner very directly at this time, at least based on what we're seeing in the media. Over at KESQ.com, authorities ask for public's help locating missing woman in Morongo Valley. The San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department, Morongo Valley Station, is asking for the public's help in finding a woman who was last seen Monday, June 28th. Lauren Cho, 30 years old, last seen Monday around 3 p.m. in the area of Hooper Road and Ben Mar Trail in Morongo Valley on foot. And we've got a few different photos of her here, so I want to leave this page up just for a few more moments. Um, but we want to check out a map and kind of get a feel for this area. So it's interesting because when you kick on the satellite view, it just gives you a whole different perspective on what we're looking at. This is desert. There is really... Um, not a whole lot until you start zooming in and you can see, okay, we've got some roads. Um, but even for that, a little cluster of something called the Rainbow Shops, an area called The Hole, which um, I believe is actually the location that, that we're looking for here. Uh, I think this is where she was last seen. The early news reports, they kind of always give vague descriptions and generalized areas, but um, by the later news reports we're going to get into today, they identify it as the whole. And what this is, is a uh, kind of an Airbnb area, and Lauren was working there. We'll get into those details more as we go through the articles. But as you can see out here, just not a whole lot, just a small cluster of buildings, looks like the occasional homestead here or there. Um outside of this rainbow shops that says it's a clothing store and it has no building associated to it, at least for when that, where that pin mark is, I'm not seeing anything for businesses kind of in the immediate area. And one thing that we are seeing that's very concerning is just tons of tough terrain. Um, and you can see, we get into like uh, kind of more mountain areas just South of this. We head back towards the highway. Uh, looks like there's a gun club that's up there. But once again, it's just very, very sparse. Not a lot of opportunities for cameras that might have seen something that law enforcement can go check on. And um, it's just it's a really tough search considering this this area that we're starting with. Over at HighDesertStar.com, she is from New Jersey but has been visiting the area for two months, according to Sheriff's Service Specialist Melissa Kramer. We're going to see a little bit of a, disc a discrepancy. I have an idea about why that discrepancy is there, but this article is saying she was visiting the area for, for two months. Over at nj.com, keeping in mind she is from New Jersey, a source close to Cho confirmed that she was raised in Hunterton County, and graduated from Hunterdon Central Regional High School in 2009, she went on to attend Westminster Choir College and was employed as a music educator for a short period of time afterwards. She also worked at a piercing and tattoo business 
in Flemington. And that's something that didn't really come up on the poster, but based on several photos that I've seen of her, um, it looks like at different times she might have had some uh, piercings in her nose. And honestly, even on that photo that I have right below me, I can't see if you can see them there. On her Facebook page, um, I saw one where it looked like she had a piercing on both sides. I've seen another one where it looks like she possibly had a piercing through her septum, or maybe she was just wearing jewelry that made it look like she had a piercing there. Um, I want to also say the the business that she worked at, the piercing and tattoo business, have been very vocal on Facebook trying to help and raise exposure to this case as well. I just really appreciate them doing that. Back to another article at KESQ.com. Massive search underway for high desert woman who disappeared last week. For the last week, a massive search effort has been underway involving police, search and rescuers, hikers and trackers using a helicopter and drones. So far, Frost, uh, Jeff Frost, who's one of the people that was helping with the search efforts, said no signs of Cho were found. We searched extensively in the field and found absolutely no tracks. She had Doc Martin boots on, he said. Anyone that's familiar with, dark, with Doc Martens, uh, you know that the bottom of those boots can have really definitive ridges in them. Um, and to hear that there is no tracks that are found where she disappeared from, that's a pretty interesting fact. Authorities now believe Cho may have hitchhiked out of the high desert, which led the volunteer searchers to canvas the Southland. Of course, you know, hitchhiking certainly comes with its own risk factor. Um, I know that they've been putting up posters. They've been going to truck stops to put up posters, gas stations, trying to raise exposure. Um, but certainly um, something that, I mean, at this point, it's it's difficult because we're almost two months into this. And I almost want to say, I hope she didn't do it. But if that means that she would have been out in the desert on her own, without water, without her cell phone, without anything to take care of her, there's a part of you that says, well, I hope she did get out of that situation in some way. We've, we've gone thousands of miles, Frost said, tirelessly went to gas stations and pasted up flyers in the low desert, the high desert. We went out to San Diego because she said in the week before she disappeared that she just wanted to go to the beach. Frost said shows passwords, laptop, cell phone, and car have been turned over to police. Uh, effectively, she took off with nothing. It literally the clothes on her back. And the story is she was kind of there one minute and gone the next. And that's really why that fact about, I mean, them finding nothing in terms of tracks is just, it's really got my attention very strongly. Over at the High Desert Star, they wrote a piece, What Happened to Lauren Cho, and um, they got on this fairly quickly. This is July 1st that this piece was published. I have to say, I am seeing a lot of people being very critical about this piece. Um, it seems to me that Stacy Moore, the author, did a good job of interviewing the people that she should be interviewing and pulling this all together into a long format. Um, we're going to lean on this quite a bit. I want to thank Stacy for her work. Uh, some of the things that people are complaining about, I, I understand the reasoning why they might be critical, but I think it's really important to keep in mind we're trying to raise exposure and not just raise exposure, but getting this story to resonate with people so that they think about her. The odds that you're going to see Elle walking down the street while you're holding a copy of the High Desert Star or you've got it on your cell phone and you're literally looking at it in your lap, practically next to none. So what's important about telling stories like this is that the humanity comes across. The things that they were into might associate to, to you. And those are the things that kind of hook in our brain and, and keep this, first of all, make this story real so that we realize this is a family that is dealing with a missing loved one. They're in pain. They're looking for help. But on top of that, we're also trying to just snare whatever piece of memory that we can get from viewers, readers, so that if they do happen to see Lauren a week after they read about her, two weeks after they read about her, maybe there's some little aspect of this story that that comes back for them, reminds them about it and gets them to pick up that phone. So I just want to say, Stacey Moore, I appreciate your, your work on this. Lauren Cho moved from New Jersey to the California desert eight months ago. So right off the bat, we're getting a little bit of a discrepancy, but I think we're going to be able to explain it later. Looking for a life of freedom and new possibilities. In a matter of minutes, Monday afternoon, June 28th, she disappeared. 
Her friend, Cody Orell, is the last person known to have seen her. The two who met in New Jersey and used to date were staying on a friend's property. Uh, just to point it back, so that place that we were looking at at the map, the hole, um, this is the property, and apparently Lauren got a job there. Um, I don't think that this is the area that they landed in when they first got to the desert. We're going to hear more, more details on that, but I'm just trying to kind of clear it up with you as, as we go, because I know some of this is going to seem like, you know, John, two articles ago you said this, and now you're saying that. Uh, on the afternoon of June 28th, he went into the tour bus that they had crossed the country in, and she apparently walked away. There was a 10-minute window there, and she evaporated, Orell said. According to the sheriff's report of Orell's call for help, placed at 5.13 p.m., so keep in mind, we know, according to the other reports, they're saying that she disappeared around 3, but obviously there was a search effort, um... Cho got upset and walked into the hills between Yucca Valley and Morongo Valley. Orel tried to find her, then called their circle of friends for help. When they couldn't find her, they called in law enforcement. They told the sheriff's station she didn't take her phone, water, or food with her. I searched all in the hills and no tracks anywhere, Orel said. So that's the second account. Uh, we've got a person that's actually helping with the search efforts. He's saying that we couldn't find any tracks. Orell is also saying, and he's the first person to essentially go looking, he couldn't find any tracks. When law enforcement searchers joined the effort, they found all my tracks and my friend's tracks, but none of hers. So now we're getting confirmation pretty much from three different sources. Her tracks are not in that area. How does she just disappear from this area? You would think if someone comes up to an area that remote and they're driving in a vehicle that her friend would have heard the vehicle pull up. And if they didn't do that, if she walked out to the highway, let's say, to meet up with someone out there, there should have been tracks leading to the highway. So this is just uh, really a very difficult, hard thing to understand. Orel thinks she got into a vehicle with someone. Quote, on Sunday, she was going out to meet someone and wasn't saying who. I didn't pry into it then, but of course, now I wish he trails off. He drove back to put up flyers with Cho's photo on them, and he and his friends are active on social media, sharing the missing person flyers and information. For RJOK, who I believe is one of those friends that's helping on this effort, Lauren Cho is a woman with plans and a dream for the future, not someone who would walk away from everything. We had dinner the night before, he said. I thought for sure she'd be back for dinner again that night. Cho was a talented soprano singer who toured with choirs in Europe as a teenager. She was also a section leader in a New Jersey church choir. Dissatisfied with her job, Cho moved out west with Orel over the winter, driving across the U.S. in his tour bus. The two had met through mutual friends on Memorial Day and hit it off. Uh, so if Memorial Day is happening in May, I don't think they're talking about Memorial Day 2021. I have a feeling they're talking about Memorial Day 2020, probably. Uh, so there's a chance that they might have only been friends and they did date for some period of time as well um, for as little as a year. But I don't think that it was. I mean, it doesn't make sense with the, the amount of time that they were out in this area. It couldn't have been Memorial Day 2021. In December, they ended their journey in Bombay Beach, a tiny community of about 415 people at the Salton Sea. So that's where we're getting the date discrepancy, I believe. They got to Bombay Beach in December. They lived there for a number of months, probably about five to six. Then she gets this job and they travel from there to the new location. And that's where she goes missing from. So I believe that she probably had that job um, you know, maybe about two months. Quote, we're both part of the community of artists down there and we live part of the year in Bombay, OK said. Cho bought an old school bus and was converting it into a food truck. We had a group of friends we started doing dinners with every night with L cooking, Oral said. They were invited to stay at a friend's house in Yucca Valley and Cho started working as a private chef for a friend's Airbnb there. So that's how this all gets tied together. Uh, in terms of the whole. Basically, she's working as a chef at this location. And just to show you guys how far that is from Bombay Beach, 
uh, quite a bit. Now, I don't know what part of Bombay Beach, like I don't know if this is just the center of it or if it's a small area clustered here, but we're talking, you know, an hour and a half drive is, is basically what Google is saying for this. So not super close to where she actually goes missing. Aurel continues, Elle's a super talented person. She's a black belt in Taekwondo and was teaching Taekwondo at age 12. She also had a parakeet named Pork Chop that she didn't like to leave. She'd be worried if she was going to be away from him for a day. OK was one of three friends whom Aurel called when Cho went missing. We immediately dropped everything and were out there all night. There's no sign of her anywhere. She was apparently trying to take her car at the time, but she didn't have the keys. She had an intention to go somewhere, and I know she was dating again. So that's another component in this in, in terms of the investigation. I hope they track down whoever she saw Sunday, the day before she went missing, uh, and question them. Did they come back around on Monday? Seems like that would be kind of a easy connection to make in terms of, you know, if, if she was spending time with someone else, said, hey, I'm kind of frustrated with what's going on here. Will you come pick me up? Um, that's another possibility that needs to kind of stay in play, I think. Someone said they saw someone matching her description in Thousand Palms. Sheriff's calls show others claim to have seen her with a man at a restaurant in Yucca Valley. So as frequently happens with missing persons cases, we do start having sightings. Uh, here we are weeks later. It seems like either these sightings haven't panned out or if they are legit, Unfortunately, they didn't get to them in time. So let's learn just a little bit about Bombay Beach, where they first got to when they got out there. Bombay Beach is a census-designated place in Imperial County, California, United States, located on the Salton Sea, four miles west-southwest of Frank, and is the lowest community in the United States. It's actually located 223 feet below sea level. The population estimate for 2020 415 people. Bombay Beach was once a popular getaway for beachgoers until the 1980s when the draining and increasing salinity of the Salton Sea destroyed the lake's ecosystem and drove businesses and private landowners out of the area, rendering Bombay Beach a ghost town. Despite this, by 2018, a number of people had moved into the area. Now on July 6th, the High Desert Star reports that the Sheriff's Department suspends the search for Lauren. And that could mean a couple of things. Uh, it could be that they've kind of run out of leads in terms of the areas to search for. Uh, that could mean that there was some environmental risk. We know that this is an area where temperature is probably substantial. Um, but typically, those kind of things can be kind of managed and handled to keep search efforts going. Kind of interesting to me that, you know, about a week into it, they effectively stopped the search. Uh, the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department suspended its search and rescue operation in the hills of Morongo and Yucca Valley. At this time, there is a current investigation. There is no particular person of interest, and all avenues of leads are being looked into, said Sergeant S. Stafford from the Morongo Basin Sheriff's Station. Sheriff's investigators do not expect to resume the search for Cho unless they receive new information, he added. So that's one of those things that's leading me to believe that you know, they were told she went walking off in this particular direction. They set up a search perimeter, searched within that perimeter, came up with nothing to continue their search. Like if they would have found something out there, piece of clothing that belonged to her, shoe that belonged to her, that could have amplified the efforts or even kind of expanded maybe the radius that they were looking into. It just seems, based on what I'm reading here, they probably didn't find anything in their initial search efforts to warrant them continuing. And Keep in mind, we've got that really bizarre fact with this case about no no footprints when all you've got out there, you've got sand, she's got Doc Martens, like that, that there should be footprints and nothing is found. Stafford said, this is being treated as a missing persons investigation and not a search and rescue anymore. The detectives in our investigation division are currently working the case. So that does seem like a little bit of a shift in focus. Uh, initially, you know, they hear this story. She was there one minute, gone the next. We think that she went walking off into the desert. So they treat it like a search and rescue operation. After they process that, they don't find any information to support it. They're kind of rolling it back to, okay, we got to start in, at square one and treat this as a missing persons investigation with all the different possibilities that come with that. 
Friends who called the sheriff's station said that Cho did discuss at times the possibility of harming herself and talked about leaving everything according to media logs. So that's another serious concern in a story like this. Um, but when you combine that with the fact that their search efforts are showing nothing, that we don't even have footprints leading off from the scene, uh, is that the strongest possibility for what's going on in this case? I'm really unsure. San Bernardino County Sheriff's spokeswoman Jody Miller told New Jersey media that there has been no evidence to suggest Cho walked into the desert or fell victim to foul play. Um, that's an interesting statement, and I, th I think you really have to break it down, but that first one is grabbing me. It's just pointing back to that same thought that I'm having about the footprints, about their search efforts. They're not finding anything to support that she actually did go walking off into the desert. But the other side of that coin, they're also saying they haven't found anything that proves uh, or even suggests that she could have fallen victim. Cho is considered voluntarily missing, Miller reportedly told a New Jersey radio station. As we get to one month of her missing over at Z1077FM.com, we get an update. The Sheriff's Department and search and rescue personnel are continuing investigations into the disappearance of Lauren Cho. In a recent update from the Sheriff's Department, Sergeant Eric Smut stated that Sheriff's fixed-wing aircraft conducted aerial searches for Cho last weekend, July 24th through the 25th, and that additional ground searches are scheduled with search and rescue teams. Additionally, detectives are still actively following up on leads, and they are in daily contact with Cho's family. Uh, there is a Facebook page. We're going to look at some comments on it, and it is a family member that is the admin for that page. They have been very clear about that as well. The investigation has been very good about uh, keeping in touch with them and, and keeping them informed of what's going on. Now, it's interesting because the last article kind of made it sound like these types of search efforts were being shut down. Now we hear, well, they're still putting up aircraft. They're flying around there looking for her as well. But this mention about additional ground searches, are we talking search and rescue type operation or some other types of ground searches? We're going to find out very quickly from the Morongo Basin Sheriff Station. Um, they're talking about search warrants from July 31st, 2021. On Saturday, July 31st at 6 a.m., detectives assigned to the Morongo Basin Station and search and rescue members executed a search warrant in the 8600 block of Benmar Trail in Yucca Valley. You guys can guess what location that is. During the search warrant service, seven canines searched the last known location where Cho was seen and surrounding unincorporated areas for evidence. Ongoing search efforts continue with future operations planned as further leads are developed in the investigation. So a very strong focus on taking it back to square one, the location that she went missing from. We don't know what types of dogs were taken in there. I don't know if these are regular scent dogs that were given some item of hers, um, or if we're talking, there's a possibility it might've been cadaver dogs that were brought in there as well. Um, let's go ahead back to High Desert Star. Once again, thank you, Stacy Moore, for digging in and finding more details about these developments. Search warrant served at vacation rental property where Lauren Cho went missing. Detectives from the Morongo Basin Station and search and rescue members served their search warrant at 6 a.m. at a property called The Hole. Uh, he described the property as a collection of Airbnbs, and that's according to Sergeant Eric Smut. We sought a search warrant due to the property owner not being present and multiple people on site living at the location, he said. This is the second search warrant served here. The additional searches we have conducted are based upon follow-up of investigative leads and resources available, he said, adding that the weather has not been favoring searchers. According to property records, the hole is owned by Tao Raspoli, a filmmaker and musician who owns vacation rentals and is part of the community of artists and other Bohemians living in Bombay Beach and the high desert. I also want to say I bumped into a Twitter account where Tao is uh, also retweeting about this case, trying to raise exposure for finding L as well. It seems to me that with that type of search effort, um, while they might not be 
directly on the trail of something that they think is foul play, they're certainly staying open to all possibilities and trying to collect as much information as possible. I mean, for them to go back to the same place twice, taking dogs back there the second time, I think that's a pretty strong statement that they're at least maybe trying to close out that avenue of investigation. Um, and we don't know if they're finding anything substantial that's going to keep them on that avenue. Now, I've seen a few threads talking about this case, and this article comes up with it as well. And I think it's just people that are trying to be helpful. But on July 1st, there was a body that was found kind of in the area, fairly, fairly, I mean, I wouldn't say super close, but we're talking about within about 20 miles. Uh, and there was another body found in an another location. Now, I think what's concerning about this is the details on the discovery of both of these bodies um, are extremely limited. They don't even say if it's a, a male or a female. So, um, and of course, the time frame. We're, we're talking both of these discoveries happening July 1st. Uh, so we're talking just a matter of days. But that also leads me to believe that the likelihood of these being L is next to nothing. Uh, she would have only been missing for two or three days at this point. Um, even if something terrible, if the worst did happen, identification of her uh, would probably have happened fairly quickly. And I don't think that we'd be talking about this case right here, right now. Um, so I don't want to put too much stock into these. I just wanted to address them because I see a lot of people online that are talking about these uh, potentially as matches for that. I don't think they are, um, but that's a very important reason why we do need a profile for L built up in NamUs because there comparisons with unidentified bodies can happen. DNA comparisons can happen and exclusions are noted. And I don't know if you guys see this unless you have an account with NamUs yourself. I think you have to actually log in to see it, but they have a tab just to show you when an unidentified body has been tested against that missing person's account. And if they determine it is not a match, that's actually listed on there. So that could be really helpful for ruling out things like this, where you know, you have um, people that are trying to be good Samaritans or trying to be helpful. They're finding records of these other instances, seeing do they match up. NamUs has kind of a bucket for catching all that information and then redisplaying it. No, we've already tested this. This is not a match. This is not a match. This is not a match. So as I mentioned, there is a Facebook page for the search, facebook.com forward slash find Lauren Cho. This is managed by a sibling of Lauren's. Uh, do me a favor. This page, I think, has about 500 followers right now. We need to bring that up. We need more people to be showing support. Keep in mind, this is a family member that's helping to admin this page. Uh, we're also going to see they're doing a great job at putting out information, not stuff that's really going to spoil the investigation. They're curbing talk about all the different theorizing and all that kind of nonsense that can sometimes happen in these groups. This is a really well-run page. Please come and check it out just as a good example of how to use Facebook for kind of conducting, uh, helping this conversation go forward in a very helpful and meaningful way and show some support to, to Lauren's family. I'd really appreciate that. Uh, in a post they put up on July 24th, well, it might finally be time for a basic FAQ post what you've probably heard or read. The authorities aren't helpful and refuse to give any updates or information. Their response, the authorities have been exceptional from the get-go. They remain in regular contact with Elle's immediate family and keep us in the loop. Obviously, not everything we are told can be shared publicly in the next breath, but this is how we know things are happening. What you have heard or read, information was turned over to the authorities and nothing seems to have come from that. Their response, some things have been helpful, but not everything is relevant. Context is key. What you've heard or read, comments or posts by various specifically elder relatives of L about this case. Their response, none of the elders in the family, especially those who are actually close to L, are posting online. What you might have heard or read, L's family doesn't think this is the time to hire a PI. Their response, correct. We've done our research and spoken with various professionals in the field to reach this current decision. We do have a specific individual that we've consulted regularly throughout all this. Should the need go down the PI route arise, we already have this connection forged and ready to go. 
what you might have heard or read, such and such person of interest is a person of interest or under investigation. Response, this is still a missing persons case. No need to accuse anyone of anything. And keep in mind, with this being processed as a missing persons case, uh, you don't need to really kick around those considerations. We know that the investigators are having those considerations. We know that they're processing those for themselves. And they've got a, a priority for them in terms of what leads are most likely, and they're working through those. Uh, the most recent post here is from August 16th. Seven weeks, where is my sister? Someone knows what happened. And that's what I'm hoping for too. I'm hoping that by some chance, this video has gotten in front of the eyes of that person that has the information. And if that's you, please help this family get that information in using the contact information we have in the details box down below. I think... Lauren's Facebook page uh, actually says it best here with the um, her, her banner for the Facebook page. Truth will set you free, but not until it's finished with you. If you have some piece of this puzzle that you haven't turned in yet, it might be at you. It, it might not let you go until you do the right thing and step up and, and place that phone call. Plus, you can do it anonymously. There's just there's really no reason to not help out this family. Um, there are currently no fundraising efforts going on. I did take a look for those as I was going through the Facebook um, page, but there are a, a few places you can have conversations about this. I would suggest over at the Facebook page, if nothing else, please show the family your support there. There is also a Web Sleuths thread that I'll have in the description box down below. Of course, Web Sleuths is always very good about being respectful. Uh, with topics like this. If you have friends in the Morongo Valley area, please, please take a moment, share this video with them. We need all eyes, ears, and hearts open and looking for L. Before I end today's video, I want to thank several people that are supporting the channel through Patreon. Thank you to new patrons, Tina Aruji, Claudia Ebner, Rebecca Campbell, Unsolved VA. Hey, I know you. Uh, plus a shout out to Charlotte Rothmeyer who rejoined and also increased her pledge. If you'd like to support the channel, please visit lordandarts.com. There you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even buy us a coffee like Becca recently did. We really appreciate your support as we try to help these families in these very tough situations. I can't do it without you guys. As we're running the closing credits today, you might notice the song is a little bit different. This is a song called God So Loved the World. It's performed by the St. Andrew's Virtual Choir, and that includes Lauren with the soprano solo part. I hope you guys have a great weekend. Stay safe, take care, and I'll see you again here on Monday on the Lord and Arts Channel.